they have tens of millions of tons of waste coal ash in landfills in Georgia. And there's billions of tons of this material around the U.S. Rather than taking that material and capping those landfills and closing it and hoping for the best, we instead take that material out. We clean it up with our technology and we can sell it into the cement and concrete industry. So rather than having a giant eyesore of a landfill, you take that and you put it in the bridges and the roads and the highways instead of using the highly polluting Portland cement. And so you get the double win. Hi, folks. I'm Connor Gaughan, and welcome to Consensus in Conversation, a podcast where we're talking to the innovators, entrepreneurs, and thought leaders who are committed to building successful businesses that also help us build a better world. One thing I love about this show is the opportunity to meet so many new and inspiring people. It's fun and exciting to explore the new ideas and fresh perspectives they bring. But it's also really fun to see old friends who are doing amazing new things, which is why this week I'm really excited to introduce you to one of my old friends, one whose work I think is very much worth hearing about. Grant Quash is a college friend, and our careers have followed broadly similar trajectories through investment banking and on to operating our own companies. While my path led me to the digital media space, Grants took him into commodities and materials, and today, he's the CEO of Ecomaterial Technologies, a leading manufacturer of sustainable cement and concrete. At a massive 8% of all global CO2 emissions, the manufacture of concrete is a huge contributor to our overall carbon footprint and a key target for decarbonization efforts. So there's tons of room for ideas in this space, and Grant and Ecomaterial Technologies have their own unique and highly effective approach, reducing the need for carbon-heavy Portland cement through the use of energy industry waste products like fly ash. With his years of experience in banking, corporate finance, and as a business operator, Grant's got a ton of insight into making ESG deals work, selling sustainability plans to investors, and envisioning the big picture of how the materials sector can support a decarbonized future. I had a ton of fun reconnecting with him and picking his brain on doing well while doing good, and I'm excited to introduce him to all of you. So let's jump into the conversation. Tell us a little bit about yourself and and where you're from. I'm uh, originally from uh, New York City, where I uh, still live today, although I spent about a decade in between in the middle of the country. I spent about 10 years living in Texas and Kentucky. I've been in the materials business and commodities business for most of my career, and it's taken me a large number of places. Those were two of them for for quite a bit of time there. And did you always know you wanted to run companies? Was that something that you always kind of thought about, like building and operating businesses? No, I don't think so. In college, I thought I wanted to become a politician. And I was pretty quickly disabused of that notion after, (laughs) (laughs) unfortunately, seeing how toxic things were becoming. And unfortunately, they've only gotten worse. And then after that, I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. I ended up taking a job right after we graduated, right after September 11th. Uh, The market was obviously pretty pretty bad. And I ended up working for a mentor of mine in the international shipping industry. And that sort of tweaked my interest in energy, materials, global trade flows, eventually gravitated toward what I really think worked best for me and hopefully pretty good at, which is helping build exciting high growth companies in the materials and uh, metal spaces. It's, It's such an interesting and unique sector. I'm curious what the learning curve was like when it comes to materials and commodities. Give us how you got up the learning curve. I think it was a combination of a couple of different things. One is I've worked at a couple of bigger institutions before kind of branching out more on my own. And so I think that's a really good way to learn industries and get a broader appreciation for a lot of what's happening in certain subsectors. For an example, I worked for about three or four years for J.P. Morgan in their investment bank. And and I was focused on those sectors, right? And so I got to see a lot of deals. I got to see a lot of different companies across a lot of different parts of the subsectors, meet a lot of management teams, have to drill in and understand a lot of business models. And, And that was a really good way to learn. The second thing is that after I left there, I went to work for a big physical commodity trading company, a company called Trafigura, essentially a slightly smaller version of a a well-known company called Glencore, 
which is public, traffic or is private. And in that experience as well, got to touch a lot of different businesses in the materials space. When you're at JP Morgan as an investment banker, the industrial practice there covers like a gazillion different things. How did you segment in your in your own mind and learn like which components of that team and practice were most interesting? What stood out as most resonant? What was most fun? You're doing a ton of deals, but you're doing them across like a wide breadth of of subsectors, as you mentioned. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I got lucky because, frankly, I got uh, asked to focus on a, a sub subsector, which was really at the time mining and metals. And uh, the way that the team was composed at that time, and there was such a sub sub sector that you could really focus on. I self selected into it, and I think you know the opportunities to do that in in various types of things, whether it's consulting or, or banking or what have you, is available. But I think a lot of times you really just have to be a little bit more forward with your desires and, and try to push toward what you find you're really interested in. You're not going to be able to obviously always create the exact role or, or set of deals that you're most interested in, but I think you can definitely lean that way. And I was lucky to be able to do so. So you made the decision to go back to business school. I did not and someday still regret that <laughs> 20 years later, but I'm curious what the calculus was in your head to head back to Boston and go to HBS. Business school for me was between the the shipping, where I worked for about four years, and then I went to JP and, and Trafficker after that. So for me, business school was, I was in sort of a non-traditional, sort of quirky niche, which was the international shipping industry. So to be more specific, I was a, an oil tanker broker. So I brokered the sale and purchase of really large ships, VLCCs mainly, which are very large crude carriers, carry about 2 million tons of crude. This can be a actually a really interesting and, and quite lucrative profession. However, it is pretty niche. And so at the time, I, I really liked what I was doing, but I wanted to go more broadly into energy and materials. And I also knew I didn't really have like the requisite skill set. I was a political science government major undergrad and didn't have the hard skills, frankly, to be able to do what I wanted to do. So I knew that going back to school could hopefully give me the ability to A, pivot my career more toward what I wanted to do, and B, get some of those harder skills. And so it was really successful for me. And when people ask me, should I go, should I not go? You know, two pieces of advice usually. One is if you are going to go and spend two years of your time in your career, I'd recommend really just focusing on the top schools. And the second piece of advice is it really just depends on where you are in your career and and what it is that you're trying to do and where you're trying to get to. And in many cases, it can be great for you like it was for me. In some cases, people don't necessarily need to do it. And if they're already on a good trajectory toward where they want to go, and this might not add a lot of value. The third piece as well, of course, is the meeting new people in the network and what have you. And that's been great. It can be taxing at times, but frankly, it's a lot of fun and one of the things that you realize after doing two years of a good business school is that, boy, you really didn't take advantage or appreciate college when you were there because <laughs> you really start to appreciate right. <laughs> having a little time to, to learn and to think once you've already put in a few years of, of hard work. What I wouldn't give to go back, right? <laughs> Post-business school, you have a couple of institutional jobs, but at a certain point, kind of strike out on your own to go make some big investments, build some businesses. How did that evolution occur? Sure. And it was it was just that. It was sort of an evolution. It wasn't just, you know, one day I woke up and said, hey, you know, I want to start a business. When I left JP Morgan, as I said, I went to go work for Trafigura. Trafigura is one of the largest physical commodity traders in the world. And as such, they trade barrels of oil. They trade tons of iron ore. But they also take ownership positions in both logistics assets and production assets often to pair with what they're trading. So they'll own a mine or part of a mine. They'll own a terminal. They'll control or long-term lease or own ships. And so I had an experience on the shipping side. I had an experience on, obviously, the banking and the finance side. So what I did originally with them was more sort of corporate and structured finance, where we would basically do transactions to provide often capital in return for flows of raw materials, which we would then put into our system. I also started shifting more toward, and while I was there, there was more of a principal investing side. We would look at deals where we could invest in these materials opportunities in order to increase the flows of these materials across the company's network and increase margin, et cetera. And so while I was there, 
looked at a number of these opportunities and one of them really jumped out. That was an opportunity to roll up a number of mining assets in the Western United States and create a new market for the product to export what had traditionally been a really domestic product off the West Coast of the U.S. Thought it was really compelling, ran with this deal, helped put it together. It was the first time I really had exposure to the capital markets and the M&A markets as a principal. And at that time, once we closed the deal and got going, we needed to actually execute on the strategy. And in discussions with the folks at Trafigura, it was decided that I would be one of the ones who would, would do that. And so I ended up joining the company directly. It's kind of a version of a portfolio company for a, a private equity fund, which is sort of what it was like. And over the next three or four years, really did just that, created this new set of markets for the company, ramped up their production profile, and uh, made a really nice success out of this opportunity. It got to a point where it had plateaued somewhat. The growth phase was kind of over, and, and that thesis had already been achieved. So at that time, I was recruited away for another mining business similar. The folks were wanted to build a greenfield operation. I'd never done that. So I thought, okay, let's try to build something new. And so that's how I ended up in sort of more of an operating type role, investing. When you look back at those first two operational opportunities and think about how different they were than the finance world that you'd come from, what were the big lessons learned that you wish all finance folks knew about what it's like to actually operate something? I mean, I think the first lesson is pretty simple but straightforward, which is people. I think often, especially if you're in banking or advisory work or consulting, a lot of times you kind of just look at cogs and you look at numbers and you sort of think, boy, it's really the the people and all the positives associated with that, but also some of the negatives associated with that are so critical to getting the business right and being successful. And it's not just the quality of the people, but also the culture that you end up creating. And some of those lessons that I learned from working with people, helping create and, and drive a new culture have echoed through some of the rest of my career, especially in what I'm, I'm, I'm doing today. So that would be the number one thing I would, I would take away. Yeah. It's not a spreadsheet when there's actual people in a room. It's a very different environment. Yeah. And the irony is that in a lot of these you know, big banks and what have you, that the people who are the best workers who get promoted the fastest and end up running divisions, et cetera, they're not good people managers. They've never really, frankly, had any training. And, and oftentimes their skill sets are actually kind of the opposite skill set that you would like for someone to be a people manager. So you can see why, you know, it's challenging. And sometimes these big these big banks, et cetera, get, get some of this stuff wrong. But some of the best folks I've worked with have just been really excellent in working with folks and just getting the best out of people. Because, you know, I was talking with somebody the other day, we were talking about investing, and they said, you know, the three most important things when you look at a company, and I said, no, what is it? And he says, management, 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 right? And if you don't get that right, you could have the best business model in the world and it could fail, or you could have the worst, I wouldn't say the worst, but you could have a, you know, a mediocre one and it could be quite successful. Sure, you can thrive, yeah. So fast forward to get us to where you are today. How did you continue on your path to where you are now? Sure. So while I was working in the mining space, there was an opportunity to invest and help in uh, starting up a, a small business. It eventually became Green Cement, which was an idea that a couple of uh, my colleagues today, John Preston and Buddy Pike, created, which was to take this facility that was basically in bankruptcy next to a power plant in Texas, pick it up for very little and try to do what at the time most folks weren't really that interested in, which was to create a much greener, lower emissions form of cement rather than using what is really the highly polluting Portland cement. And the way we wanted to do that was to take a material that had traditionally been used, not generally for green reasons, but generally for cost and performance reasons, to replace cement in concrete at very low levels and to increase it to higher percentage replacement factors. Now, that business at the time was really just a startup, and I wasn't directly involved other than helping raise capital and, and participate in the capital raise there. But I kept an eye on it for about 10 years, frankly, until a point about two, three years ago when it became apparent that in order to achieve the next level of growth, I needed to go in and push that growth myself. 
what was it about the investor pitch 10 years ago or 12 years ago now that stood out to you as something that had promise or potential? As an investor, what were you looking at to figure out if this was a good deal? As an investor, I think you often want to take asymmetric risk, right? Which is limit your downside and have a virtually unlimited upside. And so this was one of those deals that looked like that. It required actually very little capital. A lot of the facility was already there. We needed to put some money in to retweak it. We paired it with an existing contract that essentially could make money on its own doing things the traditional way. So it was a bit of a hybrid business where we could pay the bills by selling the fly ash traditionally, and we could innovate at the same time with more advanced products. So it felt like a fairly low risk, but very high potential return. So that was one piece of it. The other part was the people. I think John uh, and Buddy are two of the smartest folks, certainly around materials and maybe in general, that I've ever worked with. John used to head technology licensing for MIT and as such started over 300 companies using MIT's technology to create businesses and some stuff that you have in your home today, like uh, HD television came out of that group and, and some of John's efforts, for example. And then Buddy Pike, who's my colleague still today, who's uh, a really brilliant uh, mind on material science. And then the third piece, I would say, you know, on top of both the the people the asymmetric risk profile was this was an opportunity that had huge applications and the addressable market was just enormous. And so that sort of it folds a bit into the, the asymmetric outcomes perspective. But people don't realize how big the cement and concrete businesses are. They're 4 billion tons a year. It's the number one commodity in the world other than water. And so coming out of the commodities world, I was you know, familiar, obviously, with a lot of this and familiar with, frankly, some of the new pressures that ESG were starting to put on a lot of traditional industries like mining, which is what I was in at the time, and thinking, huh, I wonder how long it takes until some ESG pressures start coming to these, you know, the cement and concrete industry. Now, it didn't come for quite a while, but it, it's here today. Primer for folks, concrete versus cement. Can you give us a quick rundown? Sure. And don't worry if you're listening and you don't know the difference, I'd say probably 90% of people don't. Cement is essentially just the glue that helps harden all the other materials and make concrete. So concrete obviously is what you see on the sidewalk or on the highway. And that is a combination of aggregates, which is basically rocks and sand, cement and water. And so cement's only 12% by weight of concrete, but it's the active ingredient in it. So it's a powder, and that powder is traditionally created in a process that was invented about 200 years ago in England. And that process is an awesome process in the fact that it's been around for over 200 years, virtually unchanged. From a technical perspective, that's pretty rare. People make Portland cement in pretty much the same way they made it in the in the 19th century. And the issue with that, however, is that it's extremely efficient, extremely effective, but extremely polluting. So basically, the round numbers are for every ton of Portland cement that you manufacture, you release a ton of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere because you basically have to take limestone, mill it down, and cook it at extremely high temperatures. You can only cook it in these kilns at extremely high temperatures, generally with fossil fuels which emit, obviously, CO2. But actually, more than that, when you cook the material, you get a chemical reaction. And that chemical reaction drives off more CO2 molecules. So a super efficient way to create a super powerful glue to basically stitch together the modern world, and one that's been around for hundreds of years, but one, unfortunately, that nobody was really appreciating the negative externalities from until recently. Right. And then, so perfect way to segue to the pitch for green cement and eco-material technologies in general. What would you, how would you describe your product, your service, your business in a nutshell? Our mission is to decarbonize the built environment through the decarbonization of cement and concrete. And we are the leader in the way that that is done today in North America. And we believe we are the leader in the way that it will be done tomorrow. Our products essentially replace Portland cement in concrete as a way to reduce the amount of emissions associated with that concrete that you pour. And so 
There's two ways to reduce Portland cement emissions. Now, cement emissions are about 8% of global CO2. Most people don't realize that. They focus on you know, power production. They focus on like vehicle fleet. They don't think about industrial. Industrial is basically about 15% split between cement, concrete, and steel. And so on the cement side, you can essentially reduce those emissions by either making the way that you make cement less polluting intensive, right? So if I owned a big cement company, I could figure out ways to maybe capture some of those gases or use more environmentally friendly fuels. And and many people are doing that. It's very expensive, but many people are doing that. Or our approach and and what some others are taking is rather than improving how we're doing it, improving the plants that exist today, we have the ability to take non-traditional materials, often waste materials that are a problem in and of themselves, and convert them into useful materials you need less of the bad stuff in the first place. And our business model essentially is that we sell a variety of products from the, I would say, more traditional last sort of 30 years or so people have used our main product, which is called Fly Ash, which is a combustion residual product that comes off the back of a coal-fired power plant and have used it to replace Portland cement in concrete at around 20%. So that's the majority of our sales today. And that's been done for decades, and it's the most efficient and effective way to decarbonize concrete to date. That said, we're building from that, and we're building in two ways. One is we're coming up with non-traditional sources of material. Rather than going to get the stuff from the power plant, which we do today, and and we're the biggest in, in that business, we go ahead and we dig it up out of landfills, out of waste areas, and then we clean it up and we put it into the concrete. Or... We take natural materials, essentially volcanic ashes, which are a lot like the ash that we get out of these power plants, and we make them useful for the same applications. The other piece of the new business is increasing the power of the product, right? I noted that traditionally, our business is mostly 20% replacement factor. 20% is great, especially if it's economic like ours is, and it helps the overall strength and performance of the material. But we want to get from 20 to 100%. And we have products that go all the way up to 100%. Now, as you can imagine, as you get further toward 100%, it becomes harder to make these materials. They're more expensive. But we're making really good progress on that front. Our 50% replacement material, which we call Pause Slag, is the same price as Portland Cement. So we believe it's a superior product, and you don't have to pay any more for it. Our 100% replacement product, which we call Pause Sem, is a fantastic, virtually emissions-free alternative Portland cement. It's more expensive than Portland cement. And we will, over time, drive that cost down and figure out ways to make it more efficient. But today, unless you have really a green focus or a specialty application, that's generally not going to be something that you're as focused on, especially in an industry that is as large as cement and concrete. So we sell mostly on that 20% area, but we're transitioning toward those higher replacement products. And I just want to put a finer point on this for folks that are listening who, again, this is their first exposure to industry. Not only are you building a product cleaner than the alternative, but you're also doing so by reclaiming waste product. The confluence of those two things I think is really important for folks to understand because it's that has real impact multiple ways. It's a, it scales up the impact. Absolutely. We just announced last week, for example, that we're doubling our efforts in Georgia with Georgia Power, which is a subsidiary of Southern Company, which is one of the largest utilities in the United States. They have tens of millions of tons of waste coal ash in landfills in Georgia. And there's billions of tons of this material around the U.S., but let's just focus on Georgia for the moment. Georgia Power is working with us Rather than taking that material and capping those landfills and closing it and hoping for the best and hoping that essentially that they're going to be able to close them in place well enough that there's no groundwater pollution or anything, we instead take that material out. We clean it up with our technology. And you definitely need technology in some cases because some of this material has been sitting around for decades and is not that great, but we've got the ability to do it. And so we go ahead and we clean up that material, and it's just like the fresh stuff that comes out of the power plant. And we can sell it into the cement and concrete industry. So rather than having 
a giant eyesore of a landfill in Georgia, which is potentially polluting. You take that and you put it in the bridges and the roads and the highways instead of using the highly polluting Portland cement. And so you get, like you said, a double win. I would say it's a triple win because not only are you improving the issue with the landfill and reducing the emissions from your built environment, it also costs you less. And the end performing product that are in your bridges and your roads is going to be better. The materials that we have, those ashes, they're essentially called supplementary cementitious materials, SCMs for short. They give the concrete properties that it wouldn't have otherwise. And a lot of those properties are really critical now because they basically stop concrete from deteriorating as quickly. And so things like acid rain or road salt can cause problems with concrete. And when bridges fail and things like that occur, a lot of times that's because that's an older concrete that didn't use any of these types of products. So the 50 departments of transportation around the country, almost all of them, require that in critical infrastructure projects, SCMs like ours go into there so that these are going to last a very long time and be very safe. Over the course of the 10 years before you jumped into operations, was there a moment when you looked at the at your annual reports you were getting or your quarterly reports from the team and knowing what you knew about the industry said, we got lightning in a bottle here. This is something truly special. What was kind of the moment when it when you realized this you, you had a big, huge game-changing company in a pretty innovative industry in your hand? I think it was essentially, it wasn't that long ago, but it was it was a point, call it five, six, seven years ago, when we'd been able to, we, we thought we were going to be successful in working on this one type of ash and getting to this one type of product. But then at that time, it became readily apparent that actually the technology worked on a wide variety of ashes, in some cases, not even fly ashes, like I said, natural ashes, like volcanic ashes. And we could make it work for a variety of different types of products, not just that one type of Portland cement replacement. There's other areas that this technology can be useful in as well, which isn't even necessarily directly down the fairway. We continue to innovate in some of those fashions as well, but those aren't obviously our core markets today. And so I think that was really the point when I thought this could be dramatically more impactful. That said, there was a there was an issue associated with the company where it was claimed that actually we didn't have rights to the facility that we had. And until that was resolved, it essentially was a choke on growth. And so we couldn't raise more money, we couldn't invest in more facilities because it wasn't clear from the law if we even owned the one that we had. And so that at the time was obviously quite stressful, but it was somewhat of a blessing in disguise in the fact that it forced us to essentially just stick to our knitting and just sort of keep the heads down, not get ahead of anything, not try to go out and grow too early, but really continue to innovate, continue to build on this business really quietly, almost like, uh, you know, people in concrete aren't, don't normally get compared to tech companies, but I think of it like a tech company in like a stealth mode. We were nobody really talking about what we were doing. You know, for good reason, because we didn't really need them to. But when that choke basically disappeared, when we had the the clarity we needed to on the legal side, that's when I sort of made the decision, okay, I've got to get into this. We've got to drive this business. And we got to, one, raise a lot of money. Two, we need to backward integrate into our raw material supply. We did the triple indie and did both at the same time, which was a one of the hardest deals I've ever done in my career. But I think it's been obviously pretty successful and and you know, we're excited where it's heading. When you go out to the market to raise more money, how are investors viewing this opportunity? It's interesting that you mentioned that because there was a perception that investors would look at it negatively. And it was something that I had to fight quite a bit. And so, for example, the way that we structured this transaction and the capital raise was as follows. We had our business, the green cement business, and We wanted to raise more money to create more green cement plants, but as I said, we wanted to backward integrate into the raw material supply. So this company, Boral Resources, became available to purchase its Australian parent, wanted to exit the U.S. And so we, along with all the other big guys in the industry, all the big cement players, bid on the company, and we ended up being successful in in winning the bid. 
and we wanted to combine it with our existing company. Now, in order to do that, we had to pay for the new company, and we had to roll our existing company into that. And it was a bit like the minnow swallowing the whale. We were a much smaller company. Boral was the biggest one in this space. And we said we need to raise $800 million to do the deal. We raised about 525 in the bond market and the balance from private equity to supplement what we had already put into the existing business. The issue that we had was, or I had most, was in order to get the M&A deal done, we needed a committed underwrite from the banks. Essentially, the banks had to say, we will give you the debt, right? And then we needed to have the equity folks say, we will give you the equity. And it has to be under terms that are reasonable enough that this deal makes sense. And so we had to go out and talk to everyone on Wall Street or, or the big players on Wall Street. And I will tell you, there were more than a few meetings I went to when they said, nope, this has the C word associated with it. It's got coal associated with it. We're not doing any coal deals. And you walk them through and say, yes, I understand. These materials were created by the burning of coal. However, if folks burned coal then or now, this basically was a waste stream that we figured out actually how to turn it into a really good thing. And we've actually even figured out how to take the old waste dumps and turn them into a really good thing. So don't tar me with the brush of the industry that you know is polluting and that you don't want to invest in. We are going to face the realities of the market, which is people are still burning it, and there's billions of tons of this stuff in the ground, and we're going to make the best of it. We're going to take the last two generations trash, and we're going to turn it into the next couple of generations roads and highways. So it's not the simplest story, and it's one that, frankly, we were – successful in convincing a couple of big institutions to support us. And then when we went to the market, we were able to package it as the first green rated high yield bond that was done in the United States. <laughs> we were a little over our skis at the time. In fact, most people didn't really understand what that even meant, but we were able to figure it out. And we had gone out there and I'd said, I need to raise X number of dollars and I can't pay more than X percent. And so we got a deal done like that. But still the banks and such were worried that this isn't going to work out great and it's going to cost way too much money and maybe we're going to get caught hanging on to some of this paper. At the end of the day, when we went and we did a, at the time, virtual roadshow because it was COVID, we went ahead and met with hundreds of potential investors. We were looking to raise $500 million. We ended up getting orders for $2 billion from over 100 different accounts. We were able to take what was, some folks told me the debt should trade in low teens. We were able to do a deal for less than 8%. So it showed you the amount of interest that folks had, the folks that took the time to really understand the value proposition here, both from our earnings, but also more broadly to the ESG market. It was really a really nice validation of the work that we had been doing and the pounding on the table that we've been doing to say, forget about the fact that it was associated with coal. This is the most scalable way to decarbonize one of the biggest industries in the world. Seems like capital markets are beginning to more readily understand, accept, digest these types of deals. You've got a bunch of the Fortune 500 are doing independent green deals for particular products or services or streams. So you guys really do seem like you were the vanguard. I don't think we were necessarily the vanguard, although it's very kind of you to say, but I think we're helping push the industry in that way. And you're already starting to see more folks, especially in our space, get really focused on it. It's gone from being sort of a, a little thing for most of the folks in the industry, it would be nice if it were greener, to a, this is actually one of the core things we've really got to focus on. And I am still a little bit somewhat disappointed, although I think it's natural, that we still haven't gotten to the point where people are really willing to pay extra for it to cover the negative externalities or the, or the implicit price of carbon. But I think we'll get there. And we're getting there in certain markets, right? But I and we built this business to compete without any green premium. We want our business to be profitable, even if it were no better for the environment than it is, because we can compete on price and we can compete on performance. And if the environmental benefits are finally realized by the market, we are very excited by that. But in no way are we relying upon it. Well, and this is a theme I hear from a lot of, of founders and CEOs, leaders in companies like yours that are doing really innovative things in a more sustainable fashion, you know, no one's building a charity here. And 
everyone's building a business knowing that the business case has to make sense, that you're recapturing new markets, you're cutting costs, you're doing something different by virtue of building a product in the sustainable way. And if you can't do it in a way that is profitable, you're not going to succeed in the long run. Profit and doing good are two sides of the same coin. You can't just have one. I agree with you completely. And unfortunately, sometimes people almost view the profit motive as a negative. I don't see it that way. I see it as totally like you see it, which is if you really want to make a difference and you want to do it at scale, the most powerful thing is aligning those two things, right? Getting the profit motive and the technology and the focus on creating better outcomes for the future together. That's where you're going to make a scalable difference. I mean, today, if you look at our business, we are keeping 7 million tons a year of carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere in North America every year. And that's generally been done over a time when people did not really focus on the environmental benefits of our product. It's because our product does a better job and is cost competitive. Yep. You talk about the scale for a second. You're innovating in a way that is built on existing infrastructure. There are a lot of folks that are doing some cool innovations in the material science space, but maybe a little more adventurous or experimental. And I'm curious how you think about the importance of scale relative to what you're doing vis-a-vis other technologies, folks that are kind of experimenting or innovating in other ways. How do you look at the marketplace? I think the marketplace is super interesting today because you've got a huge spectrum of people that are now really focused on the problem. And I obviously am most focused on emissions from the concrete and cement sector. So on the one hand, you have folks like us who are kind of in the middle, frankly. We are not the largest players. We're not the huge multi-billion dollar, tens and 20, 30 billion dollar cement companies out there who are looking at ways to make their operations greener, oftentimes by using our products. And we're also not the really smaller VC type companies that have oftentimes no or limited revenues, but interesting ideas and technologies. Unlike tech, I would say the VC folks in this industry have a much greater challenge because of the size and the fundamental nature of our industry. Unlike a tech innovator like Sam Altman, who can write code and create chat GPT, and he's got an $86 billion business. In Sam's case, you can transmit his technology at virtually light speed along the internet. What we're trying to do is change the way that you move some of the lowest value materials, heaviest materials around the world, a hyper-local and regional market. And so co-equally important to the technology is the logistics. If the logistics don't make sense, if you can't move this material efficiently and effectively from where it's produced to where it's got to go, you're dead in the water. The other piece is we have one of the best logistics networks in the country, and it's been built. It was built by the Boral business, which was an amalgamation of several other businesses over decades. And so we have 50 terminals around the country. We have 2 million tons of product storage. We have 4,500 rail cars. We have hundreds of trucks. We have you know, hundreds of employees who know how to get this material from where it's produced to the end consumer. And then the third piece as well is when you're looking at a problem that's as large as the one that we're talking about, I like to sort of humanize the cement industry by saying 4 billion tons a year of cement is produced every year. And if you think about it, that means for you, for your kids, for every man, woman, and child in the world, a thousand pounds of cement is manufactured every year. A thousand pounds for you, just you alone. That's how big it is. And so if you're going to change the way that people are doing stuff in that industry, you need to find raw materials that are just as widely available as the traditional raw material, which has been limestone. And so that's why sometimes when you look at the VC opportunities, when you look at the nascent technologies, I think they're super cool. There's a lot of them that are really exciting. you know. And that's leaving aside the traditional you know, factors of cost and scalability, et cetera. The unique parts of being in such a basic industry, transportation and raw material availability are critical. You mentioned all the state parts transportation are, are beginning to mandate some of this product in infrastructure. Obviously, we had a, a lot of new money being announced to flow into infrastructure over the last couple of legislative 
cycles. How are you looking at that vis-a-vis opportunity and potential and, and thinking about what's happening in the, in the public policy arena? I think there's some real positives. I think, as you noted, the IRA, which is essentially a climate bill, has some provisions for businesses like ours that are trying to decarbonize, hard to decarbonize sectors. They're not enough. I mean, the IRA is hundreds of billions of dollars. The section that could apply to what we're talking about is single digits billions. That said, of course, we're attempting, we put in grant applications to attempt to access some of those monies so that we can accelerate what we're doing. And we're hopeful that that'll be successful. I would say some of the more challenging parts of that have been, frankly, that the government, as you can expect, or you might might anticipate, has been slower to sort of ramp out what they're doing on some of these initiatives. And a lot of times are trying to get everything done at once. So the IRA, which is really a climate bill, although it was <laughs> supposed to be an inflation reduction bill, so that's its own issue, but really it's a climate bill. But a lot of what has been then folded into it on the back end has been about environmental justice, equality, all good things, but not necessarily congruent with doing the most for the climate, right? And so when you start to add these different factors in there, it makes things a little more challenging. I would also say that one would think off the top of your head that what we're doing, it makes a ton of sense from a bunch of different angles. That said, there are regulations out there that make what we're trying to do more complicated. And specifically, there's one that I always harp on, which is you know essentially in EPA guidance for the reclamation of these landfills that I was talking about. Basically, it's very difficult to assume that you're going to get any more than 15 years to clean these sites up. And now I think over time, once you demonstrate that you can do it and do it effectively, sh- you should be able to get longer to do that. But many utilities are, are concerned by the fact that in theory, they only have 15 years to do this. And these projects are not short-term projects, right? When we go ahead and do what we're doing in Georgia, we're investing along with the utilities tens and hundreds of millions of dollars in new facilities that are bespoke for that site, new technologies. And these are projects that need to eventually make money. Like I said, if we have the profit incentive, we're going to do more of them. But in order to make the numbers pencil out, 15 years is a short period of time. We're trying to build a business that's 20, 25, 30, 40 year projects, right? And so common sense on stuff like that, I think could be more helpful. I think we're headed in the right direction. I think this is one area that cuts across both aisles, right? People want a cleaner, economically efficient, and better performing product, right? No one's going to argue with you about that. What is the state level? What's been the reception to what you're doing, you know, in state houses or state governor's offices, economic development folks? How are folks in states thinking about what you bring to the market? I think it really depends on on the state. I think in, in, in several, we've had a lot of success. I can't say you know, knock on wood, I haven't had anybody shut the door in our face. However, plenty of have been more supportive than others. And so it's actually, you see a lot of the support at the local and the county level. Our projects in Georgia have had the support at that level in, in, in terms of grants and things of that nature, which help us, you know, it's not the same as getting hundreds of millions of dollars from the federal government, but every bit helps. And so we're building a, additionally a project in Oregon, and we've had some good success working with the local governments there and the county governments there. I think eventually the state houses will hopefully embrace what we're doing more. You're starting to see it in areas that are a little bit more progressive, like California and then recently New York, where not really to do anything with us, but just because I think they want to be on the front foot of environment. California first said that by a certain date, you have to reduce the amount of polluting Portland cement you have in your concrete. That's in law. And so the market's going to need more products like ours by 2030 and beyond. And now New York has followed with that as well. And that'll be good because, you know, I I don't believe we're going to have a carbon tax anytime in my career in this country, even though, you know, it probably is the most efficient way to regulate carbon. But, you know, that's not going to stop states from trying to be more helpful in certain areas. It's also not just the blue states. In Texas, We work really well with the Department of Transportation there. They're the biggest in the country. And they've been really supportive in making sure that we can approve a lot of our new and more exciting technologies. It's about working with folks that understand what they're doing and appreciate that it's not always about how things were done in the past. But as long as the performance and the quality is there, let's figure out how we can support how we innovate in the future. Knowing you, I'm sure you've got 
a purview of a lot of cool things happening in the world that just you're keeping an eye on. You know, what, what else is out there on the horizon that you're excited about, whether it's in material sciences, industrials, or anything else? I and mean, what do you kind of see in the horizon that you would think is kind of exciting? Sure. I think one of the big issues we've got in this country is sustainable housing. And when I say sustainable, I mean, not just from a green perspective, but the fact that we have a housing shortage in this country. And frankly, the world could benefit as well from better ways of building. It's one of those areas where it's not only not become more efficient over time, it's become less efficient building homes and and buildings. And so we in our company are trying to address this with what we're doing for creating material, green materials for 3D printing of homes, which we think is super exciting. You can look it up and small business for us today, but we think in the future could be huge. Additionally, we have not at Eco, but on another side business, you know, I've got some association with another company called Vantum, which is making prefabricated modular homes and um, building units in a factory. And they're building several factories. And these are both greener and more cost efficient and not low quality like you would think of a prefabricated home. These are high quality dwellings. And that's another interesting way to address the same problem. You know, I mentioned earlier, 8% of global emissions come from cement. Actually, if you add in everything that goes to the built environment, which is, you know, housing and, and roads and bridges and the cement and the steel and everything, it's 40%, right? That's a huge number. And we all need a place to live and we want a high quality place to live. And so it's not just figuring out ways to do this on the cheap. The combination of what we're doing on the 3D printing and what Vantam's doing with their modular technology, these make actually better quality homes than stick build homes. They take less time, often cost substantially less. And they can solve multiple problems at once. And that's what I love to see is technologies that can solve multiple problems at once. We actually, I, I talked to Chris Anderson from Vantum earlier this year. We did an episode with oh, him. Oh, great. He's fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> yes. That's a lot of fun. One question I tend to ask everybody, and it's, I think, a good one to end on. Uh, you know, you've got, you talk about all the things that, that you're looking at that are a confluence of good technology, doing good for the world, profit opportunities. You no, know, you're a dad now. What do you want your legacy to be 10, 20, 30 more years from now? That's a good question. And it's it's a difficult one because I, ha- I was chatting with someone the other day. We were talking about priorities and they said, you know, actually the original word for priorities is obviously priority and it had no plural. There's no plural to priority, right? Because I always think, well, I've got these two main priorities. I'm juggling my family and I love my family. I have two young kids and, and my wife, obviously. And my work, which I'm really passionate about and, and, and trying to make change in the world. And I'm like, gosh, how do I, how do I square these two things? And I think, like you kind of know, the way that you can square it is that if I can focus my time and effort during the working day on how I can make the world a little bit better, a little bit more livable for them going forward, and then be home at night and be able to spend the time with them while they're young and make sure that they're leading hopefully the best and healthiest and most productive childhoods into lives in the future, it is one priority. And so, uh, you know, maybe I'm (laughs) torturing the facts a little bit to try to fit within the mold, but being able to show them that, you know, you can actually work really hard. That's, you know, can give you a great amount of satisfaction. You can take care of yourself financially and then also hopefully leave the world a little better off and lead by example. And so that's what I hope that they learn my daughter always tells me, and she loves it, and I don't make her listen to podcasts. Occasionally, I'm on TV, and she'll watch it, and hopefully, she's already buying in into it because she'll get so excited, and she says, Daddy, I'm your number one fan. Number one fan. <laughs> and I said, I'm your number one fan too, sweetheart. So I hopefully, they're, uh, they, they, they bought in on it as well. Big thanks to Grant Quash for joining us this week. It's awesome catching up with him and learning more about his approach to sustainable cement. Also super exciting to hear about his association with Phantom and fellow CIC alum Chris Anderson. Can't wait to see what they're cooking up together. If you're interested in learning more about eco-material technologies, we'll include a link to their website in the show notes, and you can check out information on their products and technologies, as well as keep up with the latest news on their mission. You can also find Grant on LinkedIn at G Quasha. For any questions, comments, or ideas sparked by today's conversation, or if you have any great ideas for future conversations, here's a reminder that we now have a show email. 
You can reach out directly at CIC at consensus-digital.com. That's CIC at consensus-digital.com. Please drop us a line. We'd love to hear from you. You can also connect with me directly on LinkedIn and Instagram at CKGONE. And as always, if you like the show, please give us a follow, a like, or leave a review wherever you listen. It really helps us grow our reach and continue bringing you more awesome conversations with the business leaders you want to hear from. All right. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you next week with a brand new conversation. Consensus in Conversation is hosted and executive produced by me, Connor Gaughan. The episode was produced by Will Gatchel and Jeff Rock with editing from the good folks at Reasonable Volume. Special thanks to the Consensus team, including Creative Director Kate Tucker, Greg Hurrogle on Research, and Patrick Gallagher on Strategy. Consensus in Conversation can be found on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you listen. Consensus in Conversation is a podcast by Consensus Media, LLC, produced in association with Reasonable Volume.